Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you today and to be able to share with you a very powerful message on influence. I've worked hard at developing this session and I hope you're ready to be able to work hard in listening and understanding the principles that I'm going to share. As I begin, let me ask you a few questions. And if this is true for you, just, I know I'm not with you, but go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you would like to have more of a voice in what goes on? How many of us would like to have kind of a stronger, more collaborative team within our department and across different departments? And how many of us would like to have a stronger influence and a greater impact so we can make a bigger difference in this world? Go ahead and raise your hand. Now, I know most of you probably raised your hands, but maybe there's a couple of you that didn't. I do have a separate session called How to Be Average and Make No Difference in This World at All. Go ahead and shoot me an email and I can get you signed up for that session. Just kidding, just kidding. I don't have that session at all. If I know anything about people that are part of this conference for DPS, it's this. You're dedicated, hardworking individuals. You're people of character. You recognize the importance of data and how our world revolves around data and how you can help make instrumental and crucial decisions by the use of your skill set and tools that you have. You're in a powerful, powerful place. And what I hope to do through this message called Becoming a Person of Influence is to give you some tools and strategies to increase the degree of influence that you have with others. Let's go ahead and get started. As we begin this message called Becoming a Person of Influence, I want to start with some incredible research from Stanford University. Stanford University came up with this question. They wanted to know what creates success, particularly success for leaders. So they did a meta study. They looked at a whole lot of studies that had been done before. They conducted some of their own studies and they came up to two conclusions, two things that create success for people. One of those is our product or process knowledge. That is how things actually work. And another of those is our people knowledge, how we can get along with people. Now I didn't go to any Ivy League school, but I could certainly tell you, duh, doesn't that make sense? Like for us to be successful, we have to be able to get along with people and we have to know what the heck we're doing. That makes complete sense. But what was astounding in this research was which one was most important and by how much. So consider for just a minute, which one do you think is most important? And if you had to assign percentages to this, what would you assign? Would it be 50, 50, 70, 30? Where would you put your percentages in regards to which one is most important. Here's what the real truth of it is. Many of you probably chose people knowledge and that's absolutely true, but here's the difference between the two. When it comes to success, particularly in leadership, 15% of our success is going to be based upon our product or process knowledge, while 85% is on people knowledge. Now this really gets my knickers in a twist because I have two college degrees. And do you want to know how many different classes I had on how to get along with people? Zero, none, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Vol. I didn't have any classes at all on how to get along with people. And therefore, I struggled. Perhaps you've had a leader before that didn't quite understand this, right? Maybe you've worked with somebody before where they focus strictly on processes and products and they really didn't pay very much attention to people. If that's you, you know, go ahead and call yourself out here a little bit. Is, is that you? Have you been in that situation before? Well, I have a confession to make. I was that kind of leader. I was that kind of leader. Let me share with you my story. So for most of my life, all that I wanted to do was become a principal of a school. That was my career aspiration. So I went and got my degree in social studies and ESL and I taught for several years at a high school. And then I went back to college and I got my master's degree in educational leadership and, and I was an assistant principal for several different schools. Then one June day, Owatonna School District, the city that I currently live in right now, called me up and said, hey Jason, how would you like to be our junior high principal? Now I know for a lot of you that might be the content of nightmares, right? Please don't ever call me to be a principal of a junior high. But for me, that was my career aspiration. It's exactly what I wanted to do. So I said, yes, I hung up the phone. I went over to my wife and we did the happy dance together and we moved the family over to the city of Owatonna. I started working as a principal and it was everything I imagined leadership to be. People were nice to me. 
They invited me to their parties. They did what I asked them to do, and I thought, I made it. You know, this is exactly where I wanted to be. And then year two hit. And in year two, I found myself hiding in this portable classroom, scared to death, frustrated, anxious, and perhaps even a little bit depressed. Why? Because I was working my tail end off. I was doing the very best that I possibly could do. And our school wasn't going anywhere. In fact, during year two, the gloves came off and I recognized we had an extremely toxic environment. Our teachers were not getting along with each other. We had serious issues with behavior of some of our students. Attendance problems were going through the roof. We really were in a mess. And I knew that everything rises and falls with leadership. So maybe I didn't cause all these problems, but I knew that I did cause some of them and that the solution to these problems was, was up to me because everything rises and falls with leadership. But I was stuck. I was showing up early in the morning and working till late. I was doing everything that I possibly could think of doing and still the school wasn't moving any further. We weren't making any kind of progress in making this a better place to work. So I got scared. And literally, for several days during the middle of the day, I went over to this portable classroom, this classroom that wasn't used very often at all, and I hid. I was anxious. And this anxiety led to depression. I, I honestly didn't want to show up to work anymore. And I kind of had two different choices to make at this point. One of those was to leave. And trust me, I seriously considered leaving the school. But luckily, my wife kind of talked me out of that. She turned to me and she said, Jason, you know, we need health insurance. We need a regular paycheck. We've got four kids. How can we provide unless you have a regular paycheck? So she told me I had to stick with it. And that meant that I had to go with my second choice, which is figure out what was going on wrong and try to fix it. So I went around and I started asking students and staff members and parents and others questions of what I could do to improve. I turned to somebody like Paul and I'd say, hey, Paul, we've been working together for a couple of years. It's not going well. You know it and I know it. We need to do something different. So help me understand what can I do different as your leader? But there was one teacher that I knew I needed to ask. She was a union president of our school. And if you know anything about union presidents and principals, we typically don't get along at all. In fact, this was very true in this situation. We did not see eye to eye. There were a lot of things that I disagreed with her on. And so I was scared to ask her, but I knew I needed to because she spoke the truth and she had a lot of influence in the school. So I asked her one day to sit down and meet. She got this big smile on her face like she'd been waiting for this day since the moment I started. And she took her arm around me and she said, Oh, Jason, Jason, you're so messed up. You don't know what leadership is about. She said, You think that leadership is about position." And she was right. I loved the title of being principal. And I was half her age, only 32 years old at the time. It was fun to walk around with that title, but that wasn't leadership. She said, you think leadership is about knowledge? Hmm? And again, guilty as charged. I had gone to some great universities. I love reading books. I have a lot of knowledge. She said, leadership isn't about that. She said, leadership is about man isn't about management either. And therefore, I was stuck on this one. You see, I love, I love leading by management. I love tasks and organization. I'd redone the student handbook and the staff handbook. We had flow charts for behavior process. I mean, things were organized really well at our school, but again, it wasn't working out very well. And she said, because you've been focusing too much on management. And then she used this analogy that still sticks with me today. She said, Jason, it's like you're a locomotive going full steam down the tracks but you've not connected to any boxcars. And a locomotive that's not connected to any So I started reading some books and I found some mentors and after a little while in chapter two of John Maxwell's book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, it explained that leadership is influence, nothing more, 
nothing less. And suddenly a light bulb went right on with me. I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly right. Leadership is influence. I don't have influence. Therefore, I need to get influence. And I looked around and I saw perfect examples of this in place. We had a social studies teacher that had no additional responsibility or title beyond that of teacher. Yet, he would say something and everybody would follow. I would mandate an order and I'd get very few responses because he had influence. I'd go to church and there were some parishioners in my church who had more sway and influence over what was happening in our church than our pastor did. Perhaps you've seen that too, you know, perhaps you've gone to a place and you're working with a, with a data analyst, a frontline new hire data analyst, and, and that person might have more influence than the supervisor or the manager of your department. Is that true? Well, very possibly, because leadership is influence. So I dedicated my life and I have studied and thoroughly researched and experienced lots of opportunities with different companies and organizations and different leaders in trying to understand what influence really is and how we can grow influence. Today, ladies and gentlemen of DPS, I would love to share with you then a framework, four different components of how anybody can build influence with anybody else. And then I'm going to give you some tools afterward that can go along with these different principles and components of influence. If you're ready to go for that, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Let's go ahead and take a look at this and get started on how we can become a person of influence. As I just stated, in my research and development of the idea of influence, I've come to the conclusion that there are four different components of influence. I've put these each of these four different components and I've tied them to a body part to call this framework full body leadership. The first component that we do take a look at is leaders need to have a heart that cares. Leaders need to have a heart that cares. Second component is this of connection. And here we can be able to use our head to connect with other people. The third piece of the components are ours is this idea of collaboration, that leaders can be able to use their hands to collaborate. And the fourth piece is courage. We use our feet to show courage. So again, the four different components of influence is care, connection, collaboration, and courage. Let's dive into each one of these individually. We'll start first with leaders have a heart that cares. You may recall f several years ago in 2010, the British petroleum oil spill. This is a massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Millions and millions of barrels of oil being spewed out into the ocean during this time. There is devastating effects on the environment, on the fish and the ecosystem of the ocean. There is effects on the beaches and tourism. Lots of bad things were going on. And people wanted answers. They wanted somebody to hold accountable for this mistake. Tony Hayward was the CEO of British Petroleum at this time. And he was on a news conference one day and just being interrogated by all these press people. They wanted answers. They wanted to know who's going to take responsibility. They're pressuring him for further information. And at one point on live national TV, he said this. He said, look, there's no one who wants this thing over more than me. I would like my life back. Now, I don't want to cast any personal judgment on Tony Hayward. But when he said this statement, instantly what the rest of the world saw was a person that just didn't care. And as I've stated, caring is the first principle of developing influence with other people. Do you know what happened to Tony Hayward after this? Well, he got his life back. In fact, two months later, he was fired from his position. You see, if we look at any influential leaders over the course of time, we'll recognize they all have one thing in common. That is, they put others before self. Nelson Mandela is a perfect example of this. One of my heroes spent 27 years in prison, gets released, gets elected president of his country. On his inauguration day during his speech, he said, I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a servant to you, my people. Mother Teresa said, a life not lived for others is a life not lived. Again, these are wonderful examples of people that first cared in order to develop influence with other people. I don't know about you, but uh, again, I've got four different kids. This is one of mine. Her name is Esther. And we, uh, when we gather around the dinner table, sometimes it can be a little chaotic. Sometimes there could be a lot of uh, conversation, even arguments going on around at the dinner. And, and we thought, you know, we should change this as parents. Let's be a little more structured. 
and we created a system where we would just ask questions at dinner time. And one of the things we were talking about on one particular day was this whole idea of care and why we're here upon this earth. And we're talking about it and talking about it. And, and I explained how we're here on this earth to be able to help other people. And my little daughter, Esther, she had this really confused look on her face. And I knew she had a question, but she wasn't willing to ask it. So I turned to her and I said, Esther, it seems like you've got a question. And she turns to me and she said, yeah, dad, I do. And I said, great, what is that? She goes, well, if we're here to help out other people, what are the other people here for? <laughs> I thought that was a fantastic question. I didn't have a good response at the time. But when we're talking about leadership and having a heart that cares, does it matter? Does it matter what the other people are here for? Does it matter how they treat us? Does it matter that they've offended us? that they've failed in some of the work that they've done, that maybe they've not fallen through, that they've talked behind our backs. If we change our behavior to other people because of how they treat us, we're not showing care. You see, I believe that great leaders, uncommon leaders, need to have what they call unconditional care. We need to care to the point that no matter what else they do, we still care for them. And when we break through on that pathway, we truly can be able to reach the heart of the other individual and get to this place where we can have influence with them. And so when I talk about leaders that have a heart that cares, this is what I'm talking about. Component number two, leaders have a head that connects. I ask audiences all over the entire world, I'm like, how, what is the best, what is the number one way that leaders can connect to their staff members, to their employees? And without fail, I always get the same response. Jason, leaders need to listen. And isn't that true? Listening is the very best way that we could be able to connect with other individuals. You see, sometimes we believe that we stand way high upon this mountain, that we've achieved it, right? We've climbed the ladder of success and, and now we're at the very top and we say, hey, come on here, up here and join me. I'm on top of the world. And we frame leadership in this perspective that we're trying to help people get up to where we are. That's a improper framework. In fact, maybe if this is the way that you believe you've been up there too long and the, and the lack of oxygen up that high is really getting to you, right? Uh, what do we need to do as leaders? We got to climb off that rock. We got to go down to where our people are at. We need to listen to individuals and really focus on, you know, what are our data scientists saying? What are our BI people doing? You know, what kinds of input and understanding can we get from other individuals? How can we connect to these people so that we all can be climbing up the mountain at the same time? This isn't an us versus them thing. It's a together thing. And for us to be together, we've got to dive to a deeper degree of connection. You see, when I looked at connecting with people, I believe there are three different degrees of connection. Our first degree we call superficial. That is, this is the kind of connection when the only thing we talk about is the sports and weather. Now, I live in Minnesota. Minnesota's got something to talk about all of the time because our sports teams are either really good or really bad. And our weather is constantly changing all the time. Every single day we're getting different changes in our weather. Now, if that is the only thing we're talking about, though, no, this is, this is only a superficial relationship. Our connection's not very deep at all. Can we have influence with this individual? Probably not yet. Probably not yet. Are they going to go out of their way to service and assist us? No, nope, that's not going to happen at all. We need to go deeper. A second degree of connection is what I call business connection. That is when we get together and talk, the only thing we talk about is business. When I was working in the school system, you know, frequently we would have social events after school or we'd meet at somebody's house and all the teachers would gather and, and we'd, uh, you know, just, just enjoy our time with each other. And we would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. But it was all about business. It was all about our students, the curriculum. It was about our administrators. It was about all the things schools were supposed to be doing. You know, all this stuff about business. But we never really got to the personal level of relationships. I didn't know much about their kids or their dreams or their desires. We didn't take the time to go to the third degree of connecting, which is a personal relationship. At this relationship, we can clearly answer the three key connecting questions, which are, what do they dream about? What's their dreams and aspirations? What's their goals for life? What do they sing about? 
what's going on right now that's really, really good in their lives. That might be something with their kids or something with their education or employment or a hobby that they have. Maybe something with their spouse. You know, what, what are they singing about? What makes them really excited about life right now? And what do they cry about? What's something going on in their life that they're just frustrated, mad about? Something that's keeping them up late at night. Again, what do we dream about? What do we sing about? What do we cry about? If we can answer those three questions about an individual, most likely we've dived deeper and gotten to this third degree of connecting, which is a wonderful place for us to be able to have influence with people. So that's the second component. The third component of full body leadership is this idea of collaboration. How can we be able to collaborate with other individuals? Somewhat similar to connection, we have this mistaken belief. You know, we think traditional leadership is about vertical leadership. Raise your hand. Go ahead and raise your hand and throw it a chat or something. You know, uh, is your organization chart similar to this one? Where you've got the leader at the very top and then you've kind of got the middle level managers, you know, right there in the middle and then you've got your frontline staff down on the problem. You know, it, it, it very well could be this way. So some of us view leadership like that. Others have taken a different approach and said, no, 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 Jason, this isn't how leadership is. Leadership should be like this. We have the senior leaders as servants to the front line. You know, we're, we're here to help out our people that are actually doing the work where the rubber meets the road. Fabulous. But that still creates kind of a hierarchy. It almost puts you in a position where you say that you're better than the others. And sure, you might get paid more, you might have a nicer office, but that doesn't mean that you're better than they are. If we're truly to be able to, be, truly to, be able to have an influence on other people, we need to start seeing people eye to eye. We need to shift the way that we see leadership from being something that is vertical to something that is horizontal. We're all on the same page. We've got the same goals and aspirations in our business. We're working hand in hand together. And that any idea, no matter where it sprouts from, can be an idea that can transform our company into something new. That's what I call horizontal leadership. So whether you be a, a data scientist or a, a data analyst or you know maybe you are an engineer or in machine learning or wherever you are, uh, we, we shift our perspective to recognize that we're all on the same level ground, moving together as one whole. That's this idea of collaboration when it comes to influence. The final, fourth piece of, 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 of influence is this piece we call courage, using our feet to show courage. I have a story for this one that probably best describes what I mean by this. So CVS Pharmacy is a major pharmacy in the United States of America. And for several, several years, they've had one particular mission statement. The mission statement of saying, helping people on their path to better results. The problem with this is that they also sold tobacco related products. They sold cigarettes. And so some of their top leaders recognize that, oh my gosh, we're in a, we're in a conundrum here. We have this philosophy, this mission statement that we're helping people become better while at the same, same time we're selling cigarettes. We need to do something about this. And so one day they decided we're going to stop selling tobacco related products. And their investors, their stockholders went berserk. They were crazy, They're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's a $2 billion loss. You see, we sell 700 packs of cigarettes every single week in our over 2,000 different stores. That's a lot of money we're gonna lose out on. Despite this and despite their arguments, a senior leader said, nope, we're gonna go ahead and do it. So on February 1st in 2014, CVS pharmacies stopped selling cigarettes and their stock went down from $65.43 to $64.64. <laughs> Not even a dollar. The next day it rebounded and 18 months later, their stock had doubled because they showed courage. You see, courage is when we have values and we match our actions to values, when we're willing to take the risks and stand out and make the hard decisions so that we're in complete alignment with where our values are currently stand. That's what it's about. Interestingly, when you look at the communities around CVS pharmacies all across the United States of America, you will see that those communities reduced the amount of cigarettes they were smoking. There was less available because CVS stopped selling them and therefore fewer people started smoking cigarettes. Isn't that interesting? That's what really happens when leaders have the courage to be able to stand up and match their values.
So I want you to consider for a minute here. Between the idea of care, connecting, collaboration, and courage, which one are you strongest in? Which one will you say is, is a strength of yours? Go ahead and find a piece of paper and maybe write that down. Where do you excel at when it comes to your ability to influence other people? Care, connecting, collaboration, or courage? Okay, I hope you understand the four different components of full body leadership, which was just a framework for us to be able to build influence with other people. I spend every single day all day long working with leaders in companies big and small, mostly in kind of manufacturing type companies with metal, middle level leaders. And, and we, we continue to focus on these four different components. And there are lots of different things we can do in each component to grow and develop them. But without fail, every single time I start working with these companies, they always ask me, they're like, Jason, this is great, this is great. We understand what you're talking about. We get the fact that we have to have a heart that cares. We get the fact that we have to have a head that connects, that we need to have hands that collaborate and feet that show courage. But can you tell us how? Like, what specifically could we do to grow our influence in each of these areas? In other words, Jason, do you have some tools for us? <laughs> and I just have to smile and laugh a little bit and say, absolutely, you see, I love tools. I love to be able to give people practical ideas about how to implement these philosophy of the four different components of full body leadership. That's what I do. So if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and share with you four different tools on how we can be able to build and grow our influence with anyone. The power about these tools is you can start using them today. In fact, as soon as we're done with this session, as soon as you're done with it, we can be able to implement those tools and start them. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look here. Okay, tool number one, give a crap, give a crap. This tool started with a lady named Ashlyn. She was a young woman going to college not too far away from where I currently live. I was a bishop of a church at the time and she was a member that had been coming to our church. Right before our church services had started, she sent me a text and the text said, Dear Bishop Hunt, I'm not coming today. In fact, I'm not coming anymore at all. I've been going to your church for two years. I feel like I'm a project. I'm done. Please don't contact me again. Well, instantly my heart fell and I said, oh crap. I said that because we really, do, we really did care about Ashland. But unfortunately, we've been focusing on so many other different priorities that we didn't take the time to show Ashlyn that we truly cared about her. Do you do that for your employees? If you're in any form of leadership position where you have direct reports, think for just a minute. Do your employees know that you care for them? I'm sure that you do, but do they know that you care for them? And, and how? How do they know? You see, when we look at the research, this is what's really scary. 79% of the people who leave a position say that they leave not because of money or some other situation from work. They leave because they don't feel appreciated. They don't belong. If you go back to your high school or maybe college days, you probably have heard about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Abraham Maslow created this hierarchy of needs, these things that we need as humans. The very bottom level of that, of that pyramid is the fact that we need safety and security, right? We, we need a, a roof over our head and we need some money and some food to be able to eat. You know, once we have safety taken care of, what's the very next need that us as humans have? It's a need to feel belonging. It's a need to belong somewhere. And we can definitely create that feeling within our organizations. But if we are not intentional about it, unfortunately, people are just going to leave. So we need to give a crap <laughs> and give a crap is our solution. That's how we make people feel that they really do belong to in our organization. It's how we make them feel that we care. It, you know, people want to know that we, we care about them, that we give a crap about them and crap is an acronym. It stands for celebration, recognition, appreciation, and praise. Again, celebration, recognition, appreciation, and praise. C R A P. This is when we take the time to celebrate accomplishments of some of our employees, what they've done. Maybe we put it into a newsletter or we have a big party for them. 
we recognize their efforts, them showing up early in the morning and staying later at night and giving their full efforts towards us. We appreciate their attitudes that they come into work with, that they're positive and energetic and that they continue to get up after they've fallen down, that they uh, you know, inspire and encourage other people to do the same. And we praise them. We praise them for their characteristics and their strengths, helping them recognize that we need everybody in our organization to be able to accomplish the goals that we have. Somebody who was really good at this was a lady by the name of Mary Kay Ash. Mary Kay Ash ran a huge cosmetics company, so makeup and lipstick and those kinds of things. And, and, and she, she was a tremendously huge success. In fact, she was known for giving a crap to her female staff, right? Most of the people that were working with her and in her organization were females. And she would give a crap, sometimes in the form of a pink Cadillac, would be the way that she would show recognition and praise and appreciation to people. Well, she said, hey, there are two things that people want more than money and sex. And that's praise and recognition. Think on that just for a minute. Two things people want more than money and sex, and that's praise and recognition. I remember one day I was doing this conference and way back in the back, some guy raised his hand and he said, Jason, 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 I think you got it wrong. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean I got it wrong? He said, I think you have the quote backwards. And I'm like, huh? And he said, here's the deal. If you praise and recognize, you will get more money and more sex. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good comment. I thought it was a pretty good comment. The truth of the matter is, we don't do it very often. According to a Gallup poll, 65% of the people they surveyed said they received no appreciation in the last 12 months. Ladies and gentlemen of DPS, I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't feel good about that number at all. I'm not okay with that stat. I want to change it. And it's only going to change if we're intentional about the way that we give crap. So here's how I did it when I was a principal. Every single di Friday, I went to my AA meeting. <laughs> Not AA as an Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? My AA meeting was an appreciation appointment. It was one hour, 60 minutes, every single Friday where all that I did was give a crap to my staff members. I would write handwritten notes and tell them what a good job they were doing. I'd send them an email. I'd go and buy some coffee for some of our staff members. I'd give it a gift card to a local store for our staff members. I would walk down the hallway and I'd find teachers that weren't teaching and I would tell them how much I appreciated them and I'd praise them for the way that they were working with their students. I would do nothing during that time except give a crap to my staff. This was my crap time. Okay, that's what I did during this period of time. And it's remarkable how that alone started to shift the culture of our school. Teachers started to recognize that I truly did care. Now, some of you might be sitting there thinking, gosh, Jason, I'd love to schedule an hour in my day, but you don't get it. I'm so busy, I don't have an hour to schedule in my day. Like, I can't, I can't figure out how to schedule the time to give a crap to other people. Well, the truth is you, you do have the time, okay? We all have 24 hours in a day. It just really comes down to prioritization. So just for you guys, just for today, I, I'm going to give you a, a, a resource, a tool, if you will, a, a cheat sheet on how you can find more time in your day. If you go to the link that's on the screen right there, influencingforimpact.com slash time, you'll find 11 strategies to help you find more time in your day. You can put these 11 strategies into your day and then clear up at least 60 minutes each week for you to be able to have crap time. Just my gift to you, I hope you enjoy it, all right? So that's our first tool. Tool number two is to permit the pause. Permit the pause. As I stated before when we talked about connecting with people, the number one way to connect with people is to listen. Unfortunately, bad listening Poor listening is the common cold of bad leadership. It's just simple as that. As leaders, we don't listen very well at all. Now, before you go and beat yourself up about this, there's a good reason behind that, okay? The University of Missouri's done some research and they recognize that, hey, we speak at about 120 words per minute and we can process about 400 words per minute. That means our brains have the capacity to both listen and to do something else because it doesn't take our entire degree of brain power to be able to listen to other individuals. So what do we do? Well, if you're like me, you start thinking about how you want to respond. You start thinking about your to-do list. You start thinking about what's for lunch. You start judging them for what they're wearing. You start looking around at other things that are going on. 
You wonder in your mind, when is this person going to shut up so that I can get back to work? Connecting was a difficult thing for me, as you can tell. Those are thoughts that continue to come into my mind when other people are talking. And they don't get me anywhere. You see, they don't get me to be able to connect with people because it doesn't allow me to listen. So the second tool is permit the pause. And permit the pause is simply a strategy for us to be able to listen better. When I talk about permitting the pause, here's what I mean. You're in a conversation with somebody. You're talking to them. They're talking to you. When they're talking to you, you listen completely. You don't allow anything to go into your head. No thoughts, no responses. All you're doing is just listening. And when they're done with their sentence or their statement, when they're done talking, you keep your mouth shut. You don't say anything. In fact, you stay silent for three seconds. That's what we call the pause. Now, it's going to be terribly uncomfortable, okay? One of the number one reasons why we come up with responses when people are talking to us is because we're fearful of that pause. We as humans don't like pause between conversations. So we continue to think, you know, what am I going to say next? And what am I going to say next? And what am I going to say next? And how can I respond to that? Right? We don't want pause, so we continue to say these things. In fact, sometimes we even interrupt them or talk over them because we're so fearful of the pause. I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, hold off on that thought. Like, don't worry about the pause. Embrace it. Allow it to happen. They speak and just be silent for three seconds. What's going to happen is they're going to keep talking. They're going to keep talking. I recall when I was working as a leader over um, a couple of dozen individuals, and I, I started using this practice. First off, it kind of caught people off guard. They're like, wait a minute, you're normally, you know, jumping in and interrupting us, and what's going on right now? And I said, well, I'm just trying to become a better leader. And I also recognized that I was getting to more of the root of what's going on in each of their lives. You see, they'd come into my office with some kind of problem, and they'd explain it to me, and I'd just sit there and wait three seconds. And that forced them to think a little bit deeper. That forced them to flesh out more of what the concern was, to tell me some more details that maybe they weren't as comfortable to tell me at the beginning, or to even come up with solutions or uh, answers to some of their own problems. It was really incredible when I just allowed three seconds to go by without interrupting them. Okay? Here's three very powerful things that can come from permitting the pause. First off, this frees your mind from judgment and response creation. You don't have to worry. Just listen. That's all you have to do. Secondly, it shows them that you care. And we already talked about how important that is. If you want to show care, become a better listener. And third, it increases the quality of your responses. This one, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to trust me on a little bit. Because your biggest worry is going to be, what am I going to say next? Well, just trust me. Your intuition, your gut, you'll have some kind of inspiration that will come and will tell you exactly what you need to say. And it will be better and of higher quality because you thoroughly listen to the other individual. So that, my friends, is tool number two. Tool number three, strengthen the strengths. Strengthen the strengths. So this is a report card that we received a couple years ago from my oldest son, Ethan. Take a look at that for a minute. And why don't you go ahead and think about, maybe even throw in chat, what's the, what's the first thing that you would do if this was your son's report card? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I certainly turned to my son and I said, Ethan, tell me what's going on in English class. And he came up with some kind of crazy excuse and I interrupted him. And I said, no, 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 Ethan, I don't think you get it. You see, in our house, hunts don't get seized. And then I proceeded to give him an outline of what we're going to do. I said, Ethan, uh, first off, we're going to get extra help for you in your class. Secondly, we're going to have your teacher send home some extra practice that we can be able to do here at home. Third, we're also going to look at some after school support. Maybe there's some tutoring or guidance you can get after school. And we're going to ask you to do these things, these three things and work really, really hard at them. But please know, please know that if these three things don't work, your mom and I are more than willing to hire the meanest and ugliest tutor we could find to help you improve your grade. Well, I think we scared him because he started working harder. And for the next month, he put everything he had into his class and he moved his grade. He got his grade from a C all the way up to a B minus, a B minus. 
we were quite disappointed in that. But we were disappointed because we didn't understand this one fundamental rule about human personality. And this is what the rule is. When you focus on weaknesses, the best you can normally expect is average. That is, if somebody's got a weakness and we work really, really hard at it, the best we can be able to expect them to get to is average. That was the same for my son. His weakness was English. We worked at it very hard. We got him up to about average. And here's the truth of it. Nobody likes average. Right? Think about it for a minute. Imagine that some new um, uh, store showed up down the road, a coffee shop. And they said, hey, come on over and buy our coffee. We, we have average coffee. Well, of course not. You're not going to get there to get your coffee. Or could you imagine the hospital in your local community doing an advertising campaign and saying, hey, come and get your surgery done today. We have average surgeons. Well, you're not going to sign up for that at all. Or could you imagine your own organization? Hey, go ahead and trust us with your data. We're really average at analyzing your data. Big data, we, we, are, we are average with big data too. And you know, our customer service support, that's pretty average too. And our data scientists, they're average. And you know, our, our uh, learning into, you know, machine learning specialists, they're, they're, they're pretty average too. You know, we're, we're, just, we're just pretty average. Well, of course your company's not going to do that. If that was the model and the mission of your company, you would go bankrupt overnight because nobody likes average. We want exceptional. We want uncommon. We want extraordinary. We want something to be better than average. And how can we get there? We can get there by focusing on our strengths. You see, when we focus on our strengths, there is no limit to where we can be able to go. Imagine if I went back to my son, Ethan, and I said, Ethan, you got an A in math class, huh? Yeah, Dad. Well, tell me about that. Oh, Dad, man, it's just... Uh, it's easy. Like I spend half the class on my phone because I'm just waiting for the rest of the kids to get caught up to me. Really? Yeah, dad. I said, what do you think about getting you into a more advanced math class? Or maybe there's a club or activity after school that could really test your math skills. Or perhaps, you know, I've got a friend who works as a financial analyst. Maybe you could be able to go and job shadow with him and see how he uses math on his daily basis. Ah, oh, Dad, that'd be ham. I'd love to be able to do that. You see, and how high, how far could I be able to take my son in mathematics? Who knows? Who knows? Because there is no limit when we focus on the strengths. So I want you to think for a minute here. Reflect back on your employees, your direct reports, people that come to you. What are their strengths? What strengths do they have? And how can you be able to help build their strengths into higher degrees? Maybe they're really good at uh, machine learning. Well, well, fantastic. Is there a new role or some different responsibilities you could be able to give to them for that mach machine learning piece? Maybe they're really good at uniting a team and having them come together and speaking honestly with each other. Great. Put them in charge of some of the teamwork pieces. Maybe they're excellent at the sales side of things, right? They're just really good at talking to people and kind of, you know, building up whatever organization you're working with. Well, fantastic. Put them in charge of some people. Put them in front of people. Let them really grow in the strengths that they have. And I promise you, when we do that, when you start focusing on the strengths of the people that work in your organization, they will get better, you will get better, and your organization will get better. Here's some of the very interesting research from the Gallup industry. They said this, they found uh, thousands of companies all across the entire world. And they found companies that fell into three different categories. Some companies where they gave no attention to people, nothing on weaknesses, nothing on strengths. They just didn't give any feedback to them at all. They found other companies where they focused
we have to understand our strengths before we can find strengths in other people, right? So what strengths do you have? That is our uh, third tool, strengthening the strengths. Okay, tool number four, use the five second rule. This is a tool for courage and how we can be able to show courage when tough things come up or when situations come up in our lives. Um, I get this tool from Mel Robbins. She wrote a book called The Five Second Rule. And she said this, if you've got an impulse to act on a goal, you must physically move within five seconds or your brain will kill the idea. Think on that again. If you've got an impulse to act on a goal, you've got to move. You've got to do something within five seconds or your brain's just going to shut the idea off. You probably have experienced this uh, when you're thinking about exercise. Maybe you've made some exercise goals and you're sitting there on the couch one day and the thought pops in your head, hey, I should get up and go for a run. And you're like, well, I don't know. The weather's not so great or I don't have very good running clothes or my shoes are worn out or whatever. And within five seconds, that thought is, is gone and you don't get up and go exercise. Well, as leaders, trying to make a more positive impact on your employees, we're gonna get these little in thoughts of inspiration all the time. If we truly care for people, if we've connected to them, and if we've been collaborating with them, particularly on their strengths, then we are going to get these pieces of intuition. Things will come to our mind and will come to our heart of what we need to do in order for these individuals to be better, in order to grow them, in order for us to have more of a powerful, positive impact in their lives. And my challenge to you is when these thoughts come up, that we take action immediately. Now, Mel Robbins had had a really messed up life, okay? Her work was, it was in the tank, right? Things were not going well at work at all. She had bad relationship with her husband and her kids. And I mean, basically everything in her life was just falling apart. And as she's going, you know, nodding off to sleep one night, she's got the TV on, and the news is playing, and, and they're showing the, the launch of a space shuttle. And it goes five, four, three, two, one, blast off. That's the last words she hears before she goes to bed. The next morning, her alarm clock goes off, and normally she hits that alarm clock over and over and over again, right? The snooze button and, and, and just continues to delay waking up because she's not motivated for her life. She's, there's nothing really going on very well for her at all. But for some reason, this particular morning, she just thought, five, four, three, two, one, and she got up. First time in months, she actually got up at her alarm. Well, that was different. And she started feeling more self-confidence and a greater degree of um, just happiness and positivity. And so she tried it again. She had an impulse to be able to do something nice for her husband that morning. Five, four, three, two, one, blast off. She went and did it. She went off to work and she had a couple of new ideas and some things that she wanted to share with some other employees. And she just kept using this over and over again. And in a matter of a very short period of time, her entire life transformed because finally she had a tool to give her the courage to take action on things. You see, leader, ladies and gentlemen, as leaders, we have lots of thoughts in our heads. We have lots of decisions we need to make. We have lots of ways that we can be able to have a positive impact on people. But unfortunately, our tasks and our um, you know, busy, busy lives and the plates that we have that are completely full sometimes prohibit us from taking those actions. I love this tool because it's simple as this. Five, four, three, two, one, we get up and actually take action on making a positive impact in people's lives. It's a really powerful tool to do this, all right? I want to share this tool in practice and conclude by sharing one final story. So this is my second son, his name is Eli. And we, I grew up in a small town, it's called Plain City, it's in the state of Utah, it has about 3,000 people in it, so relatively small. And every single 4th of July, this town of Plain City, Utah, has a 5K, a 5,000 meter run. Now I have run in this race many, many different times. During high school and during college, I was a cross country and track runner. So I'd, I've run in this race many times. In fact, I have won this race several times. So we're getting ready to go back to Utah and visit my family. And we happen to schedule our family vacation back to Plain City, Utah over the 4th of July holiday. And I get really super excited. I'm like, yes, this is going to be great. I want to go back and run in that race. You see, I was in pretty good shape. 
it had been about 20 years since I'd seen a whole bunch of my high school buddies. I knew they were going to be there that day. And, and so I signed myself up. I signed my boys up and we are committed to go run this 5,000 meters. The gun is up in the air. It's seven o'clock in the morning. I've checked out the competition and you know what? I think I'm going to win. Right? I looked at the previous times, the winners in the past years, and I knew what I could be able to run. And I, I thought I was going to be able to win this race. So I'm feeling very confident. Definitely there's some high school buddies around, and I wanted to show them that I still had something worth, worth of value. Well, I look over to my oldest son, Ethan, at the time, and he's looking pretty confident. It seems like he's going to have a very good race. He's probably going to get a personal record. That'd be great. And then I look over at my son, Eli, and he's scared spitless. In fact, he's never run three consecutive miles before in his life. He's never run a 5K. So now I have a decision to make as a dad. Do I move forward with my own agenda, with building my ego and proving to my old high school buddies that I still have something? Or do I give all of that up to be able to have an impact on my son? Now I can't say that I've always made the best decision as a dad, but right before that gun went off, I decided I'm going to put him first. In fact, I even counted five, four, three, two, one, blast off and made the decision to help him. And for the next three long and grueling miles, <laughs> I poked and I prodded and I encouraged this son to continue to run. And as we got closer and closer to the finish line, I slowed down a little bit and allowed him to cross that line. And as I watched him, I can tell you, there are few moments in my life when I've ever had as much joy as I had when he crossed that finish line. Remarkable experience. It was a once in a lifetime experience for me. It really, really felt wonderful. Why? Because I had used my influence to make an impact on this kid. Certainly I cared a lot about him. Through the course of his life, we've connected in a lot of different ways. And then through our collaboration together, I helped him continue to run through the race and to get to that finish line. Ladies and gentlemen, you can do the same thing. With the people that you work with or with others in the community or people that are in your life, when we become a person of influence, we can help other people win by following the four different components that it takes for influence, which are having a heart that cares, a head that connects, hands that collaborate, and feet that show courage. So my challenge to you, ladies and gentlemen, is just this. Let's go ahead and put these four different components of influence into your life by using at least one of the tools of influence that I've shared with you so that you too can be able to use your influence to help other people win. So I thank you. I thank you for being engaged and paying attention here. Hopefully you've learned something that can be able to help you become more of a person of influence. If you want to contact me in any which way, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, you want to talk about anything else, I'm more than happy to do that. You've got my name, my phone number, my email address, and my website up here on the screen. I also want to give a big shout out to the Data Platform, uh, the, the Virtual Summit for 2021. What a great program that they've put together all the time and effort they've put in in making sure that they provide extreme value for us and, and a special thanks to them. So ladies and gents, again, thank you for paying attention here.